All right. I hope everyone has gotten back who may have stood up to stretch. Welcome everyone and I reconvene this meeting of the Episcopal Church of the Transfiguration, which as you may recall, we technically convene to conduct our elections in the fall and then adjourn for three months. And then this is a reconvening of that annual meeting, okay? So I call this annual meeting of the Episcopal Church of the Transfiguration back to order. I'm so sorry. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, source of all wisdom and understanding, be with those who take counsel here today for the renewal and mission of your church. Teach us in all things to seek first your honor and glory. Guide us to perceive what is right and grant us both the courage to pursue it and the grace to accomplish it. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Oh, this is not going to work. Rebecca, thank you. All right, I'm, I'm so sorry, Rebecca, but I'm just going to like wink at you whenever I want to. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. Mm -hmm. All right, first up is my report. I feel it is important to begin my address by reviewing the year in worship at Transfiguration. And I do so not only because it is hard to remember anything these days. I mean, I had to ask several staff people to come in and join me and it took us an hour just to put the pieces together from January through April last year. It was so hard to remember last year. So I do so not only because it's hard for anyone to remember what happened last year, but also because by re re refreshing ourselves of those details, it reveals just how much creativity, resilience, patience, and faith that the Church of the Transfiguration possesses. Our first worship service of 2021 was the second Sunday of Christmas, which we actually recorded in the middle of December of 2020. That day, we recorded three Christmas services before then taking all the Christmas decorations down, putting Advent, Fourth Advent back up so that we could do Fourth Advent, and then taking Fourth Advent back down, putting Christmas back up so that you could come inside to do the Stations in the Nativity. No one misses those days, let me just say. <laughs> on Epiphany, we were all outside on a frigid night. And friends, we kept up, not yet. <laughs> and we kept up our outdoor services throughout the winter and spring, unless it was raining or unless it was near freezing. And I am extremely proud of and grateful for our musicians who had the hardest time with that, cold fingers. And for all of you who came, many of you, every single week we offered that outdoor service. When that was the way we could worship together, you came and it was inspiring. We continued to pre-record our Sunday services on Wednesdays in January and February, but in January we finally began using the newly installed camera equipment in the church, which is controlled from the AV booth, which meant that we could finally let the dynamic duo of Robert Hacker and John Mikowski retire from their nearly year-long effort as camera operators. For many months, it was a handful of staff on site here, and Robert and John. They were the ones in this building every week. They were amazing. Thank you. 
We would then send all that recorded video to our friend Alex Vorce at Shiny Box Pictures, and he would edit it all together and publish it to Facebook and YouTube on Sundays. And that editing was not free. That was an expense we did not anticipate, and it was paid for by a generous donation of some people who don't want to be known, but I am deeply grateful to them, because it meant that what you viewed online every week was beautiful and beautifully assembled, and your comments, your gratitude, your appreciation is, uh, is something we were able to receive, but was really owed to a whole assemblage of people, including those donors. However, no one loved pre-recording services on Wednesdays for publishing on Sundays. Let me tell you, it was hard on the staff, the clergy, all the volunteers who had to come in on Wednesday afternoon to be lectors or anything else made for a strange week. And we finally planned to begin live streaming with the equipment on Ash Wednesday. But you may recall there was a little obstacle to us being here for Ash Wednesday in the form of a giant polar vortex. Now, truth be told, there were more than a few of us in this church last Ash Wednesday. But we were cleaning up. Can you hit play? Yeah, see if it'll play. Hit, see if you can hit play on the, yeah. But we were cleaning up from the massive water leak that filled this space with two inches of standing water. I can't begin to express how close we came to catastrophe and how grateful each and every one of us should be to our neighbor, John Seltzer, whose concerned phone call to Jordan and Jeremy Teeple set in motion all of the events that saved the day. I will forever remember the feeling of splashing down that center aisle. And then similarly, the feeling of joy at the sight of over 20 parishioners, including a number of children, including the children of the Seltzers, not parishioners, who came over that day on emergency notice and helped us squeegee all that water out of this church. All right, you can move forward. There's one of them. So we couldn't live stream on Ash Wednesday, hmm. but we did begin that next Sunday because there was very little damage considering how many hundreds or thousands of gallons of water were in this building. We went right back to work and it didn't have any significant lasting effects. And so we began live streaming that very next weekend. And of course, once a month, we conducted the complicated process of sending out the sacrament to parishioners in over 50 zip codes. Now initially the church was empty for all those live stream services, except for the clergy, the video team, a lector, etc. Then in March we finally opened up registration for a small congregation of 30 to attend. In Holy Week we upped that number to 45. We even figured out how to conduct the night watch on Monday, Thursday to Good Friday in person. Then on Easter, we knew we wanted to have a grand celebration of the great vigil of Easter, the pinnacle of Christian worship. We knew we wanted that to be our Easter service. That meant moving it from Saturday night to Sunday morning, and that meant moving it outdoors. And it was a service for the ages with a giant bonfire, a full immersion baptism, gorgeous flowers, giant panels featuring the art of the front of our altar, Music that was jointly led by our Transfiguration Choir and many dozens of birds. And the sight and the feeling of the sun slowly rising behind us as we celebrated the first Eucharist of Easter. In Eastertide, we increased the registration cap up to 75. We kept the outdoor service going, but it was clear by April that everyone was tired of registering to come to church. Ann Schmidt was tired of being bouncer to all y'all. <laughs> we were all done. Then on the day of Pentecost, Bishop Smith visited 
And so we planned another big grand outdoor celebration with Imperial Brass. We had it all planned out and ready to go, and it rained. So we made the last minute decision to move inside. And there were a couple of hundred people here that day. It was strange. Do you remember it? It was strange to be in this church with a couple of hundred people when it had been empty or had only a few dozen for so long. And yet it was also, even with that bubbling feeling of nervousness, it was also joyful. And fittingly so, given that it was the day of Pentecost, because it came for us like a jolt to our community to propel us forward out of our anxiety and toward the hopeful and better days that were awaiting us. Which is why almost immediately after the day of Pentecost, we flipped and returned to our full pre-pandemic worship schedule with all of the services happening in the church, masked, with no registration requirement. And this included the resumption of the table on Saturdays and resuming all of our weekday Eucharists as well. Usually the summer is a very sleepy time at this and every church, really. But as more and more people became fully vaccinated, attendance at Transfiguration actually grew every single week all summer long, which was deeply satisfying, because every week we saw two, three, four people we hadn't seen in person in an, over a year. And by the grace of God, we have kept it up. Worship is at the heart of this and every church, and we are proud to continue to offer the full array of services that our community knew before the pandemic. We continue to live stream all of our important services, including most of our funerals now, and that will not change. Occasionally I still get asked, are we ever gonna stop live streaming? And the answer is no. This is all possible thanks to the dedication of our entire core of liturgical ministry, ministries. Dozens and dozens of people make worship happen here. It doesn't just happen. And when we came back and we resumed, having all of those services all over again, it was very hard because not everybody came back to serving in the ways that they had before. So I have an important request for all of you today. I know that if you're attending this meeting, either in person or virtually, I'm preaching to the choir. So I have an important request for you, choir. If you are not yet involved in a liturgical ministry, if you are not yet an acolyte or an usher or a greeter, if you are not yet a part of the altar guild or the flower guild or something that helps Sunday, Saturday and Sunday happen for all of us, I'm asking, what are you waiting for? We need you. Please volunteer. Among all of the events of 2021, there are no highlights. Great, that's right. Oh, there we are. No highlights greater than the successful relaunch of the Transfiguring Our Foundations Capital Campaign. We had been forced, of course, to suspend it at the outset of the pandemic. But then last March, our amazing campaign leaders, Jim and Tammy Kirkman and Jordan and Jeremy Teeple, met with Vestry leaders and I, and we all decided that we were ready to get it going again. Our capital maintenance needs were not going away, and if we waited any longer, we were going to lose all of the momentum that we had so carefully cultivated for all those months back in 2019 and 2020. So with courage, faith, and hope, we relaunched last April. And with the help of our consultants at CCS, especially Alex Fruin, featured there in the middle, and thanks to the incredibly hard and dedicated work of over 50 volunteers, over a span last spring and summer of four months, we actually reached and then surpassed our original goal of raising $6 million to repair and maintain this campus and to ensure that we can continue to repair and maintain this campus in the foreseeable future. So far, 
we've actually received over $3 million in cash already in hand, of which we have already spent $600,000 on a range of maintenance projects all around the campus, and you can read about them in the BGNT report, in the annual report. This year, the Vestry and our Director of Operations, Bracken Reese, have, all, have projects planned just for this year, of projects planned that will cost $1.5 million in addition. And those include updating Roper Hall, installing AV equipment in the parlor and vestry room, airlifting a giant new air handler up onto the roof of the church. You're going to want to be there that day if they let us as the helicopter drops that in. And of course, the entire remodel of the Roper Hall kitchen. At last, it's happening. <laughs> and later this spring, later this spring, our 51-year-old church will receive a brand new roof. And we are replacing the slate on the roof of this building with Tesla tiles. These Tesla tiles not only look great, but they are solar energy generating. They are solar cells. And so they will actually generate upwards of 10 to 15% of our total campus energy usage. And get this, it doesn't really cost much more to replace the roof with Tesla tiles than it would with slate. I don't know what that says about slate or what that says about the descending price of Tesla tiles, but I know that we have hit the sweet spot in this opportune moment to accomplish a wonderful goal, doing something we needed to do, and then pursuing our eventual goal of energy neutrality, carbon neutrality on our campus. It's marvelous. And that will begin in April or May. Meanwhile, we've been able to allocate over $760,000 already into the new infrastructure fund of the endowment. As we continue to receive your contributions, your payments towards your pledges, we will continue to add money into that infrastructure fund until it reaches the $3 million that we set out to create it with. And then if the market cooperates, please, Lord, we will have significant funding sources to pay for capital maintenance on our campus for years and years to come. It's marvelous. Already, it is bearing fruit. You may recall that when we reached six million, I announced to you that we would go ahead and stretch towards one additional million dollars to try to make our goal seven million. That's additional million dollars is how much it would cost to completely renovate and expand our sacristy, which is in desperate need of an update. So we hired Beck to, ha to help us create a concept and then we worked with the Altar Guild and a whole array of other parishioners to gather input. And they have offered us this design. And you can go ahead and toggle through one more. It's 50% larger, including more storage, better traffic flow, a connection instead of going outside, a connection through the hallway into the hallway and the nursery and the bookstore. Through the fall, we received many dozens of additional pledges of support, which meant we got to two-thirds of the way there. We were about $665,000 for several months. And then in December, we received a remarkable pledge of $250,000 that boosted us right to the edge. So we sit at $6.9 million, friends. And so I'm humbly asking everyone who has made a commitment to the campaign, 300 households so far, to consider raising your pledge by $1,000. If you haven't made a pledge, you get to jump in at a really good moment. <laughs> if everyone who has pledged just raised their commitment by $1,000, we would surge right past that $7 million stretch goal, and also have enough to cover any contingencies we can foresee in all of the volatile stuff we're dealing with right now. We are doing the work of making this place better than we found it, making our beloved campus a blessing to future generations. And I look out at this room and I am so grateful to all of you for making that happen, so thank you. 
Now, even as I ask for your help to get us across the finish line of our capital campaign, it is important to acknowledge that our annual operating budget, which you will hear about in just a few minutes from the chair, outgoing chair of our Budget Finance and Administration Committee, Robin Caldwell, our budget for 2022 just passed reflects a 6% deficit. That's because we're still waiting to hear from about 80 families who pledged in 2021 but have not yet submitted a pledge for 2022. Now last year, at the outset of 2021, we also passed a similar, roughly 6% deficit budget, and we ended the year, as you will hear from Robin, with a very modest little surplus. So we know we can do this. We know that this deficit is not just gonna exist all year long because you again and again and again step up and show generosity and support. But I have to say it is very stressful to begin the year again without having the funds we need for our operation. And so if you haven't yet gotten around to making your pledge for this year, even if perhaps you are still regularly making payments through direct debit you're having direct withdrawals, you're still giving to the church, but you haven't made a pledge, we can't assume you're gonna do that all year long, so we don't count that as a pledge. So if you haven't yet, I hope that you will do so very soon. As Robin will share, the vestry has been forced to dip into our restricted accounts to fund many of our ministries this year. Y'all, that's like eating your seed corn. You can't do that very long and stay healthy. At our annual meeting back in 2016, oh, one more. At our annual meeting back in 2016, the vestry, that's okay. You're there, you're there. At our annual meeting back in 2016, the vestry launched a five-year strategic plan. And this strategic plan featured five core areas of our life, inclusive community, reverent worship, compassionate service, formative education, and sacrificial stewardship. And around those five pillars, we built 36 goals in all. And some of those goals were eh, relatively easy to achieve. Some of them took virtually the entire time of that strategic plan. And some, ultimately, we just had to let go of. They were intended all along to guide us for five years, but I know that no one will blame us since the five years turned into six years because, you know, pandemic time, it doesn't really like all measure the same way. So two of those years were in the pandemic, so five-year plan went to six years. It is not hard to look around and see the fruit of those goals. One at a time. They propelled us to launch the table as our Saturday service so that we could diversify our worship offerings and offer a new pathway for people coming into the Episcopal Church from other traditions. They caused us to strengthen our food pantry and ensure its funding stability. They led us to expand our clergy staff and hire Pastor Nancy Stefano and a curate to better support our pastoral ministries. They inspired us to host an entire Episcopal Church-wide evangelism conference and to hire Ann Schmidt as our director of evangelism and to make evangelism a focus of our formation for an entire fall. They spurred us to create the Connections Committee to help us welcome newcomers better and more easily. They motivated us to revamp our nominations committee so that we can more effectively recruit the skills and talents that we need to serve on vestry and the committees. They motivated us to move our worship and formation online to reach a wider audience. I will confess the pandemic helped us get that one done. <laughs> Thank you, COVID. They propelled us to lobby general convention for access to same-sex marriage, and we just celebrated three years of marriage equality, and yesterday we had the joy of hosting marriage of two men in this church, and it was just another day in the life of transfiguration. 
They stirred us to expand our pilgrimage and retreat offerings. They inspired us to grow the endowment, which will triple in size long before our original goal of 2026. This one, I have to say, the endowment trustees, when, I set, when we set that goal, looked at me like I was a crazy man. And we're going to meet that goal before the deadline. They challenged us to become a zero carbon campus. And we are now headed in the right direction with the installation of the Tesla tiles on our church roof. And they initiated a multi-pronged process of study and analysis about how we use our campus, and what we need it for, for the future. And that inevitably, eventually, resulted in our successful Transfiguring Our Foundations campaign. All in all, there is a lot to be proud of. I'm grateful to every single vestry member and committee member over the last six years who kept us driving toward these goals. I look around and I see so many of you and I'm so grateful for all of you. And to all the members of this church who played a part in helping us achieve that wonderful list of accomplishments. All the glory though, of course, goes to God, who is the power behind each and every holy thing we are ever able to do. And now at the end of all of that holy effort, we find ourselves back at the beginning. For now it is time to pray and think and dream together again. What is God asking us to do? Who is God asking us to become? How are we going to use our skills, our energy, our privilege to bless the world? The challenge is not going to be coming up with ideas. The challenge will be in figuring out what is ours to do. We can't do everything. So what is God asking us to do? We can only do some things, a few things. We can do them with great love and with our very best efforts. This is my eighth annual meeting as Rector of Transfiguration. In many ways, I still feel very new, like I'm still finding my way around. In other ways, and I would say especially in the last two years, it feels like I have been here forever. <laughs> I remain deeply grateful for the health of this church when I arrived, thanks to the leadership of my predecessors, fathers Roper and Godwin. Their friendship is a gift that I cherish every day, and I would consider it a joyful success if my tenure is even half as fruitful as theirs. Later this year, I will have the privilege of going on sabbatical. The vestry and several former wardens worked closely with me to develop a plan for this sabbatical leave and I'm proud to say that with their help, I received a grant from the Lilly Family Foundation to fund it in its entirety. My time away will feature three pilgrimage journeys to three different places in the world and plenty of time for rest and renewal. I will happily share more details in the coming months. I'm aware of the time, so I won't do that today. And I'm not leaving until August, so there's plenty of time. Thanks to the strength of our staff and ministry leadership, the church is going to be in fantastic shape during my leave. But I'm not the only one going on sabbatical this year. With the vestry's support, Joel Martinson will also go on sabbatical this year, beginning after Easter and lasting through midsummer. Assuming his plans remain possible, he will enjoy a remarkable opportunity in Scandinavia to learn, rest, and grow. I know I speak for Joel in saying we are deeply grateful for this opportunity to take a time away from our work to restore ourselves so that we can offer you our very best. In conclusion, you need no reminder of the challenges of these times. In addition to, and perhaps as a direct result of the pandemic, 
We are, as a society, becoming angrier, pettier, less forgiving. We've been steeping for so long in so much stress and anxiety that the fabric of our society is beginning to tear. We saw that on fiery display last January 6th at the United States Capitol, but there are similar fires smoldering all around us all the time. At restaurants and grocery stores, on airplanes and sitting in traffic, in classrooms and in school board meetings. There are no magical fixes for times like these. There is no leader. There's no election, there's no special prayer that will solve all that ails us. Just like we didn't reach the bottom of this deep chasm overnight, we will not claw our way out of it in one night either. It will require the patient commitment and efforts of people who really will try to truly love their neighbors as themselves, and that work is lived out daily, hourly, minute by minute. Christians with a passion for justice, mercy, and inclusion make up a tiny minority of our society. But I believe that we are something like smoke jumpers who will eventually turn the tide on this catastrophic blaze that is bearing down upon our world. Yes, we may be few in numbers, but if we have the courage to wield them, the tools God has given us in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and generosity, they are exactly the tools we need to get out of this smoldering valley and to arrive at those greener pastures. But in the meantime, friends, remember to look around with the eyes of faith and hope. For in this church, where so many discover that they belong, in this place where so many of us are known and loved and fed, in this community where we seek and serve Christ in all persons, God is helping us to see just how green those pastures really can be. Thank you. All right, I invite up Oliver Cohn, our outgoing senior warden. few quick words about the year we just went through. Like everything else at Transfiguration at the time, the vestry retreat last February was a virtual affair, but we still set our sights on several meaningful goals for the year to support the church's health and our growth. So we continued our commitment to supporting Father Casey in meeting the staffing needs of the church. I've always felt that relative to other parishes of our size, we have for several years operated with a pretty lean full-time staffing group, and we've been extremely fortunate to have relied and been able to depend on a number of retired and part-time clergy and staff members. So as a vestry, we continued 2020's decision to make the youth director a full-time position, it had previously been part-time, and we are happy to incorporate in the budget funding for a new full-time member of clergy. And we were really happy when Father Casey recruited Father Ted to fill that role. We prioritized the name tag initiative this year. We committed to helping ensure the sustainability of the newly formed racial justice ministry. We supported the columbarium committee, uh, which planned and built out phase three of our columbarium. And of course, we relaunched the Transfiguration Our Foundation's cap capital campaign. And through Jody and the Building Grounds and Technology Committee, 
we prioritized and funded a number of key projects. Also this year, with the help of Jay Madrid, our Chancellor, Sophie Lawrence, our Parish Administrator, and Bracken Rees, our Director of Operations, who of course didn't have much else to occupy his time this past year. <laughs> we renewed and we amended the lease agreement with Parish Episcopal School for their use of buildings on our campus. We updated a number of the economic features of the agreement, and we extended that lease through the June of 2034, which gives us a good long runway of predictable support for some of our campus's maintenance costs. So on a personal note, I'm truly grateful to have had the chance to serve on our vestry for these past three years. Above all, I've been able to witness firsthand this time the dedication of our clergy, our staff, and our volunteers, just as Casey was mentioning, in times that have been far from normal and have required a lot of creativity and extra effort, long days, and trips to this building when people were supposed not to be in this building because it was their day off. Getting to know our wonderful group of staff in particular has been a joy. As a parish, we should all realize how lucky we are to have them, and I hope all of them understand quite how much they achieve on a weekly basis that so much enriches all of our lives. So thank you, all of you guys. Thanks, Casey. Next, we'll hear from Robin Caldwell, the outgoing chair of the Budget, Finance, and Administration Committee, who will also speak on behalf of Allison Murphy, our treasurer, who can't be here today. Well, hello. As Father Casey said, my name is Robin Caldwell, and for the past two years, I've, chaired the, I've served as chair of the Budget, Finance, and Administration Committee. First, I want to thank the parish for their financial support this past year. As you may recall, last year Transfiguration adopted a hybrid budget with expenses associated with both an in-person and an online community. Given reduced pledges, we had planned a deficit budget and continue that belief as we reviewed the budget this past summer, anticipating a $132,000 deficit. The good news is that the parish maintained their financial support, and particularly with unscheduled gifts made in December, FIG ended up with an $18,827 net positive. And on top of this, you enabled FIG to surpass the initial goal of the Transfiguration Our Foundation's capital campaign, and we are now so close to achieving our stretch goal. We thank you all for each and every gift. The bad news is that currently pledges for 2022 are lower than they were for 2021. This slide. $36,822 lower than this time last year. And as you will note, pledges in pledging households have trended down as the graphs show. In fact, pledging households were down this year, are down this year. We have only 362 right now versus 431 pledges this time last year. Keeping FIG financially strong during this time is that the average dollars pledged per household have increased. In a nutshell, FIG's budget is based on pledges. While gifts made at year end have helped FIG achieve a positive financial position these past years, we cannot budget based on the presumption that year end gifts will continue to come in. And meanwhile, the expenses associated with running a church this size have increased. It costs more to run a hybrid church, as you will note on the graph. Virtual worship, formation, and other programs depend on IT support, software subscriptions, video communications, and telephone and internet. In-person worship, formation, programs, and office staff no longer working at home means that we continue with expenses such as heating, air conditioning, water, cleaning, and sanitizing. This past week, Vestry adopted the 2022 budget, a full copy, copy of which will be available on the church website. Our base budget has a deficit of $220,319. 
This reflects the current overhead expenses of the church set against the pledges that have been received to date. We don't have commitments of support to match our expense commitments. The majority of our costs are fixed in nature, staffing, insurance, utilities, etc. And we cannot reduce that overhead without cutting into the muscle of transfiguration. But as a vestry, we believe that it was important to take what steps we could to limit the anticipated deficit. The budget that has been adopted for 2022 reflects a $128,779 deficit, roughly equal to the deficit of our revised 2021 budget. This reduction in projected deficit was achieved primarily by removing costs from the operating budget where our programs and ministries have available restricted funds accumulated over past periods. Of course, this is not a sustainable strategy for the long term, but it does provide us with a good amount of relief relative to current income projections. Mid-year, Vestry will review the budget in light of the current financial situation at that point and make adjustments as necessary. With the PPP funds that Transfiguration received, we will be able to absorb some level of actual deficit but additional reductions in the budget may be necessary before the end of the year if the income picture has not improved. My two takeaways for FIG. One, if you have not pledged, please do. As Father Casey has said, your continued financial support is much appreciated, but our budgets are based on pledges. If you have not returned a pledge response card, we would love to hear from you or you can pledge online using Realm. If you have a continuing gift to FIG that is automatically deducted each month, we still need your pledge card for 2022 completed and returned, as it cannot legally be considered a pledge. And it's never too late to pledge. Please contact Sophie Lawrence, parish administrator, if you have any questions for assistance with your pledge. And my second takeaway, a hybrid church costs more to operate and as Father Casey also said, we foresee a hybrid church in the future. We all are looking forward to when we can get together like we used to, hopefully without masks and social distancing. But we are aware that there are times it is nice to drink a cup of coffee and attend formation and church worship in our pajamas. <laughs> Fig very, very much values the gifts, your time, your talent, and your treasure that, we, that you offer, and we thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. All right, if you will stand, I want to read the names of all the faithful departed from 2021. Jane Hall Ferguson. Nicholas Spiros Georges, William Henry Grona, Betsy Peel Hardman, Judith Ann Harrell, Virginia Carol Johnson, Sue Ann Kerrigan Kempton, Richard Edward Kerner, Ann Sharp Mason, Jeffrey B. Mullins, Elizabeth Ann O'Donnell, Nancy May Park, Alan S. Patrick, Betty Marie Sacchetti, Marion Davenport Triano, Lois Aline Waller. Rest eternal grant to them, O Lord. Please stay standing for one more minute as I read to you the names of those who were baptized last year, entered into the household of God. Bryn Charlotte Bean, Rachel Wilder DeVay, earlier on the photograph, Hannah Jane Thompson, Georgia Claire Baker, Declan Thomas Paulus, Owen Biscardi Beckley, Sophia 
Artemis Matsumura, Cecilia Adelaide Surly Strong, Ian Jacob Renner, Phoebe Rose Hill. And we rejoice at the entrance of these saints into the household of God. You may be seated. Those endowment trustees, would you please stand? Ooh, there's only a few. That's okay. We have no new trustees to install today. I'm happy to share with you that two trustees who were reaching the end of their tenure, their terms, chose to renew for a second term, including John Caldwell and John Motram. I'm grateful for Alan Dunlop, our chair, John Motram, who just stepped down as treasurer, and Renee Thomas, who has stepped into that role. I'm grateful to these servants for all that they do, maintaining our endowment, which is a gift to the future. And it is a gift to our present as well. For, oh, in 2021, the endowment did such things as fund, and I'm looking out and I see so many name tags. That's awesome. Funding our name tag initiative, including the handsome display board, helping us replace so many prayer books and hymnals that were in bad shape in the church, enabled us to hire a landscape designer to create a plan for improving the entire area around the bell tower. Woohoo! They're funding our update of the wayfinding signage in the campus, which if you've ever really noticed, a lot of that signage directs you to things that don't exist anymore. <laughs> Outdated and inaccurate, it was time to update it, and we thank the endowment for making that possible. They funded the original art piece that we commissioned in honor of Cindy Hauser at her retirement, which will go up not this coming week, but the next, in the space in the hallway upstairs on the second floor, it is gorgeous, and I can't wait to do a dedication later this uh, year. All of those grants came from the Legacy Fund. Y'all may be seated. Thank you. The largest of our unique funds. Oh, Carolyn, I didn't see you over here. Carolyn was over here, too. In addition, grants were made from the Music Fund for new choir chairs, from the Youth Fund to sponsor youth pilgrimages that are coming up, from the Outreach Fund to support several of our partnering social service agencies, from the Seminarian Fund to provide scholarships for our two seminarians. Our endowment does amazing and important or impactful work. And so I invite you, if you have not already, to include the endowment in your estate planning because the church you have loved and served and supported in life can receive your giving, your generosity, your support, even after you die. And you can reach out to any of those trustees or to Sophie Lawrence uh, with questions. All right. I'm going to recognize our four departing vestry members. And when you are recognized, if you will come up and just sort of stand up here so we can honor you. She was up here a minute ago. I want to welcome back Robin Caldwell. Robin is a big reason I'm here. Robin chaired the search committee that led to my call as rector. So I have known Robin for as long as I've known anybody here, and I have been grateful for her from the very first time I encountered her. She is the epitome of diligence, dedication, and devotion. She has, for the last two years, served as chair of BFA in the most tumultuous and anxious administrative and financial times. And yet, she is so intelligent and so faithful that she was always solution-oriented, even in the midst of deep problems. She was helping us figure out, okay, well, now what do we do? Rather than freaking out, which is what I would have done. Rob and I am deeply grateful for you personally. And we are deeply grateful for you as a congregation. If you don't go very far, if you'll just stay right there. 
Next, Rosemary Luquire, who I don't think is here today, but I'm going to go ahead and honor her. A person of incredibly keen intelligence, and not just about practical matters, but also with a keen awareness of social, emotional, and spiritual matters as well. She was always willing to tackle any assignment, including chairing the nominations committee, chairing the sabbatical committee in anticipation of two important sabbaticals this year. And I tell you, it was so important to have her perspective and insight whew, in these last two years, given her professional career as a nurse and hospital administrator. It was wonderful to have a person with her skill set leading our church in just a moment such as this. Mason McCamey. Mason has worn many hats at Transfiguration. Choir member, leader of Open Door, outreach committee. Mason doesn't know how to just be a part of something. He always rises to the surface as a leader because he wants to help it get better. He has a relentless desire to want to help things improve. And he offered that passion and that energy to the vestry for the last three years, always asking good questions, always spurring us on, always taking on leadership and projects that made a difference and that few others were volunteering for. Mason, I am so grateful for you. We are all so grateful for you. And then lastly, Oliver Cohn. I first got to know Oliver when I came and he was involved in our stewardship efforts. And I recognized right away a servant leader if I'd ever seen one. He wants the very best for our church. He cares so deeply about our mission and all people. He is so caring and compassionate, so loving and gentle. If you've had a chance to know Oliver, then you know what I'm talking about. He also never asks of others what he is not willing to first give himself. I've checked in with Oliver every week for the last couple of years, and I have to tell you that his calm and non-anxious presence was almost always a blessing straight from the hand of God to me. Any way that I was able to portray calm and steadiness, I had to receive that first, and this is a guy who helped me receive it from God. So I am so grateful for you, and we are also grateful for you. All right, it is now time to briefly adjourn the annual meeting to call and to call a meeting of the vestry to order. And if all of our current and incoming vestry members will come forward. And you can just stand here at the bottom. Thank you. Wonderful. Excellent. Thank you. I present to you Chip Brown, Gabrielle Dyer, Kevin Siegel, and Keith Young to be admitted to the ministry of vestry member in this congregation. Have they been duly elected by our church? They have. To these newly elected members, Will you faithfully serve the mission of transfiguration as a member of the vestry? Let us pray. O eternal God, the foundation of all wisdom and the source of all courage, enlighten with your grace the wardens and vestry of this congregation, and so rule their minds and guide their counsels that in all things they may seek your glory and promote the mission of your church. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
In the name of God and of this congregation, I commission you as members of the vestry of Episcopal Church of the Transfiguration. I appoint Mark Ramsey to serve as senior warden in the coming year of Church of the Transfiguration. Mark, may God give you grace to serve this church faithfully in the year ahead. Yeah, family. Are there any other nominations? All in favor of Peggy Quoka becoming our junior warden, say aye. Aye. I nominate the following people to serve the vestry and congregation in the coming years. Dave Madrid as chancellor, Evan Williams as assistant chancellor, Alice Murphy as treasurer, Elizabeth Nicodemus as clerk. All in favor of these appointments, say aye. All in favor say aye. Aye. Is there any other business to discuss? Then I adjourn this meeting of the Vestry of of Vestry of Transfiguration. You may be seated, thank you. We reconvene annual meeting in order to do the highlight of the day, which is the presentation of the Tau Cross and Crown Award to this year's recipients. There is something very much in common among this year's recipients. They were all deeply instrumental in helping us execute an amazingly successful capital campaign. But they have all been dedicated servants of our church in numerous other ways too and are extremely worthy of this award, our highest honor at Transfiguration. And so to present the first award, I welcome up Carolyn Lewis, herself a recipient of the Tau Cross and Crown in 2014. I'm delighted to present the Tau Cross and Crown today to a very special member of our congregation. A former senior warden, during her tenure on the vestry, she helped us make significant advances in our strategic goals, and her leadership was instrumental in establishing the discernment process that led us eventually to the Transfiguring Our Foundations Capital Campaign. In addition, she was the force behind our new pathway um, process to parish leadership. She recognized that, our vestry needs specific skills and abilities to effectively lead a church of this size. So she assisted us to launch a nominations committee that helped us identify future leaders. Another senior warden who worked with her on the vestry said, she's a steadying influence. She is never one to brag about herself or her accomplishments, always listening and processing so that when she spoke, it was reasoned and to the point. Like the old ad, when T.F. Hutton speaks, people listen, and I listen to her. Our former rector, Father Godwin, says of her, she has for many decades been a consistent, constant, and quiet voice of support for her parish church, the ministry, and mission. Casey said her calm, thoughtful presence has meant so much to me. She's a leader who balances an array of professional skills, intelligence, organization, dedication, with gentleness and sensitivity. In addition to her leadership on vestry, she has been closely involved with the Labyrinth, Flower Guild, and Heart Paths. One of our members on the Heart Path team describes her this way. She is an excellent teacher. She knows her subject matter, personalizes her studies, and invests herself with each person, meeting them where they are. Among her crowning achievements with the Flower Guild 
In addition to catching Pokemon and Pokemon Go on campus with one of our team members, has been to frequently create arrangements for the font that are taller than the rector is. <laughs> so I'm delighted and honored to announce that Nancy Jagman will be our 2021 recipient of the Talk Awesome Crown. Turn everybody and wave to the camera. Hi, Nancy. We love you. She is one of those many, we've all been there, COVID exposed, needed to stay home, but she is tuning in and I know she's watching uh, from home and we're deeply grateful for you. Thank you, Carolyn. Our second uh, award presentation will come from Susan Fisk who received the award herself in 1994. Those of you who know me well, including my husband, know I like to talk, but to follow Carolyn, oh my gosh, I should have worked harder on this. <laughs> okay, this tall cross and crown recipient is a husband, father, grandfather, community volunteer, business entrepreneur and innovator, faithful parishioner of transfiguration. He is a kind and thoughtful man, the classic gentleman. It has been my pleasure to know him for many years and to call him my friend. During the saga, perhaps you will figure out who he is. Many years ago, he and his wife came to Transfiguration while they were looking for another Episcopal church. For more than 25 years, I was the second grade Sunday school teacher. And while they were searching for a new church home, their child came to church with them as they checked us out. She joined my class, and I have to say, we bonded. The family would wear the I am a newcomer sticker. I think that's what it said, and I don't think we have those anymore. Finally, one day she told her parents, I am not wearing the sticker, I am a member as if saying, I am here, and I guess you better be here too. And so our church has been blessed with his family's presence and ministry. Another favorite story about our person. He became my co-teacher for Sunday school, and I have been blessed with super co-teachers, including Susan Smith and Sue Gray, Kathleen Bowers, Kelly Ayers. We always want men to teach Sunday school, the children need to see that, and men are good teachers. But there were very few back then who were doing that job, and our hero was excellent. One Sunday, and remember this is second grade students, one Sunday he arrived in class, bent over with piles of wood on his back. He was acting at the story of Isaac, making the sacrificial pyre for himself uh, as he followed his father Abraham orders. The kids were amazed. A drama, an actor with piles of wood on his back. Would there be a fire? No, there was no fire. <laughs> In the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians, we each are said to have a gift, and this person has more than one. In the business world, he created a firm that does so much to help schools and businesses with facility needs, energy auditing, sustainability issues, and operating improvements. In honor of the firm's 30th anniversary, its celebration mission has been to champion successful learning environments and to bring awareness to the community of the inequities in school facilities. In the wider community, he has had leadership roles with Ursuline Academy, 
the Rotary Club, and he has served on the board of St. Philip's School and Community Center in South Dallas, the school that supports underserved black community and which our parish supports. And at Transfiguration, he has supported the church by his faithful presence and worship as a Sunday school teacher, as part of altar ministries, the key roles as MC and acolyte warden, and as a member of the outreach committee and as a supporter of Voice of Hope, and he's now a trustee of the endowment fund. An extra comment, not many things at Transfiguration are named for people. There's the McMaster Library, there's the Godwin Organ, there is Roper Hall, and there is the Kessler Report. <laughs> the Kessler Report explains what all is needed and necessary for this church to maintain and improve its buildings for ourselves and for future generations, for people we may never know. His gifts of time and talent and expertise and wisdom to create this significant document are nothing short, short of extraordinary and amazing. So help me welcome Bill Kessler. Perfect. Thank you. Um, all the stories are true. Our final presentation will be made by Deb Boopsing, who received the award herself in 2015. Morning, everyone. It was a little over 20 years ago that I first walked through those doors. Since that time, a lot of things have changed here at the FIG, but a few things remain constant. We are steadfast in our mission to seek and serve Christ in all persons, and we are blessed by individuals steadfast in service who not only do what is asked of them, but also create a vision and shape the future. Over the past two decades, as a church community, we have been molded in one way or another by the individual I'm here to recognize. In that time span, this person has taken on a vast number of roles, the list of which would rival a CBS receipt. In the early 2000s, this person was a fixture greeting visitors, shaping what would be the future of the church by welcoming them and then shepherding new members into various ministries. This individual showed the power of community and that hard work and hard play go together, at times with impressively high standards for both. <laughs> this person spent years in the choir loft and years here on the altar, using their gifts Sunday after Sunday. They are passionate about the worship of God and they help us maintain our tradition of beautiful, reverent, precise liturgies. This is all punctuated with a giant exclamation mark by his most recent project for the church. Under his leadership, we were able to take the so-called Kessler Report and turn that into an actionable plan and timeline. The magnitude of that task cannot be overstated. In Father Casey's words, he was the driving force behind our fine-tuned capital campaign goal of $6 million. His work allowed us to articulate specific needs and speak with confidence about our plans and priorities. During this time, he was at his best, thoughtful, analytical, solution-oriented, mission-focused. He cha facilitated challenging meetings and conversations 
with his characteristic vision and determination, spending innumerable hours on this daunting task. To put it simply, without his leadership, the capital campaign would not have succeeded. This is just one more example of his lifting us up, shaping our future, and ensuring that the best is yet to come. It is my very great privilege and honor to recognize this year's final Tau Cross and Crown winner, Matt Beckel. Uh, Tau Cross and Crown time, it's the best. All right, we have reached the end. If you'll stand, we will pray. Will you pray this with me? Almighty and ever living God, hear our prayers for this parish family. Strengthen the faithful, arouse the careless, and restore the penitent. Grant us all things necessary for our common life and bring us all to be of one heart and mind within your holy church. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless, preserve, and keep you this day and always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. This meeting is ended. <laughs>